Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief of priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If any want to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and lose their soul? Indeed, what can they give in exchange for their soul? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus. You may be seated. A few days ago, my father reminded me of an experience that we had had in 1969. We had been riding through the Andes Mountains in Ecuador, and it was about, oh, 10 o'clock or so at night. It had been raining hard for several hours, for several days, actually. And the bus in those days, you could call it a bus, was kind of like a wooden structure built on the back of a truck kind of served as a bus, but the bus was always slow as it climbed up our little mountain roads, and it was, uh, and it was slower than even normal. We knew something, though, was seriously wrong when we saw crowds of people up ahead of us standing in the rain out in the middle of nowhere, and we soon began to hear the people shouting and pay attention to what they were saying. They were shouting, derrumbe, derrumbe. It meant that the mountainside had given way. So we got out of the bus and we walked, I don't know, 30, 40 feet or so ahead of us, and we saw that the entire road had fallen into an abyss. It's difficult to describe the awe and the terror that you feel before a, a kind of vast drop like this into nothingness. We felt it that night for sure. It was far too dark to see the jungle far below, but we knew it was there. We could feel its primitive presence underneath all the darkness. And we slept on the bus that night, not certain that the road on which our bus was parked would also not give way and plunge into that dark void. The tropical rain continued to fall on the people on our bus and outside it Inside and outside, they were singing or swearing or praying or whatever it is that they wish to do. Probably some people were cooking on the outside. That always happens in Latin America when you get stopped like that. But what we didn't know as we slept there the best we could was that through the night, a few lone workmen, brave people, had risked their lives to shoot a string across the chasm. And they had attached that string to a rope and then finally to a steel cable that they had stretched across the chasm. And then in the early morning, they had prepared a kind of a platform, wood platform, a little larger than a large uh, kitchen table and attached it to a steel bar. And on top of the steel bar, they had hooked up a pulley uh, wheel uh, and they intended that wheel to run on the steel cable. And our bus driver informed us that he had radioed ahead for a bus to meet us on the other side and that we would all go across the chasm on this, on this little platform two by two. But in our morning light, we could see the abyss. The chasm was perhaps 30 or 40 feet across this gorge that had plunged 
hundreds of feet below that, that the mudslide had opened up. And I remember my father saying, there's no other way home, we just have to cross. And so he and I sat on this table-like piece of wood and held on to that steel bar as men on the other side slowly began to pull us across the gorge. Occasionally there would be a slight jerk as the workmen readjusted their grip and the wheel above us on that cable would groan and the platform would sway underneath us. The trip across took maybe five minutes at the most, but it seemed like a terrifying ride that lasted forever. Only when we reached the other side did we remember that we had left behind all of our luggage. That was okay. Fortunately, the workers uh, had rigged up a system to get the luggage pulled over separately, and it was far too dangerous to add any weight to that crudely and quickly constructed device we rode on, and as a matter of fact, two days later, it gave way with people on it. The important thing had been just to get across the chasm in safety. I thought about that experience this week in the light of, this, of today's gospel reading. Jesus said that following him involves a cross. Unless we misunderstand Jesus, the cross is not for the purpose of crucifying others, but for crucifying parts of ourselves. Furthermore, the Lord Jesus said that avoiding this cross would result in the loss of our soul, but accepting the cross would lead to the salvation of our soul. Following Jesus then would not be easy. It would not result in gaining earthly power. And in fact, following Jesus would systematically destroy our desires for self-advancement, control, and fame. If we decided to gain our lives, we had to lose them. And if we were willing to lose our lives for his sake, we would find them. The New Testament offers two strong images, two metaphors to help us understand our spiritual journey from Christ's perspective. One of those metaphors is crucifixion and the other one is circumcision. Both metaphors speak to the same issue, cutting ourselves loose from idolatrous attachments in order to find life for our souls. Christ teaches us to travel light because our journey is precarious. If we don't leave some of our luggage behind, some things that we may cherish behind, we risk the loss of our souls. And what will a person give in exchange for his soul? The cross, that is to say martyrdom, is throughout Christian history or has been and, and still is in some places a physical possibility. But it is for everybody a spiritual reality. Christians are, par, are called to surrender parts of their own lives, parts of their lives that others will find entirely normal. And it is here that we make the most important choice of our lives. For Christianity might be true and it might be false, but it doesn't survive if we try to trivialize it. A cultural Christianity that demands nothing of us, but rewards us with social respectability just because we show up for church is not in the end Christianity at all. Christianity without a cross is a parody of faith that uses religion to support certain social norms and structures of power, but it is not the way of Christ. The cross confronts our thoughts. It confronts our loyalties and our behaviors. And how does it do that? I want to tell you a few ways that the cross does that. First, the cross cuts away our inordinate desires. The word inordinate means disordered. That is to say something disconnected from what we claim to be the central goal of our lives. Christians, for example, don't get drunk because sobriety is one of the central aims of our spiritual life. We don't go to prostitutes because exploiting others for our own pleasure is inconsistent with viewing people as made in God's own image and likeness. We don't cheat on our spouses 
because we have made a covenant with them and we intend to live with them until we are parted by death. We don't cheat people, not even the government or the companies we worked with. We don't do those things. Of course, Christians desire to do those things sometimes. That's what we call temptations. Temptations don't make us evil. They just reveal our humanity. But we gradually come to see that the desires that lead us into the wrong ways of doing and thinking from a Christian standpoint as disordered, as inordinate. And because these desires lead us in the opposite direction of forming a godly Christ-like character, we slowly allow ourselves to be transformed in a way that our desires change. In his book, The Road to Character, David Brooks writes about how Dorothy Day converted and was baptized. But she didn't see any harm in remaining promiscuous. She liked her sexual life and she liked it the way she liked it and she didn't see any need to change that. So she kept going to church like lots of people do nowadays. I'm not perfect, just forgiven, you know the slogan. And she kept participating in the life of the church just like lots of people do, thinking everything is okay. But there came a time in her life where she met the cross and the Lord said, if you're gonna follow me, you gotta kill some stuff off. And we're all gonna face these moments in our life that may be different from each one of us. But defining desire as either ordered or disordered implies that desire must be, must be trained. Which if we think about it, it's not so strange a concept. After all, children would rather eat ice cream than carrots. They would rather go to bed without brushing their teeth than to brush their teeth. They would rather watch television and play video games than do their homework. But because a child's desires are unformed and untrained, healthy parents insist that their ch children turn away from these desires and learn to embrace attitudes and behaviors that will lead to the flourishing of a good, healthy life. Frank Sinatra wrote a song about it. A mule is an animal with long, funny ears. He kicks up at everything he hears. His back is brawny and his brain is weak. He's just plain stupid with a stupid, a stu stubborn streak. And so, by the way, if you hate to go to school, you might grow up to be a mule. <laughs> or would you rather swing on a star, carry moonbeams home in a jar, and be better off as, than you are? Or would you rather be a pig? Now a pig is an animal with dirt on his face. His shoes are a terrible disgrace. He's got no manners when he eats his food. He's fat and lazy and extremely rude. But if you don't care a feather or a fig, you just might grow up to be a pig. That's the one great moral statement of Frank Sinatra. Well, that's all good, fine and good for children, but what do we do when we're all grown up and can do whatever we want? Well, that depends on the kind of character we want to develop. As the writer to the Hebrews puts it, we must look around at us at the people we admire and consider the outcome of their manner of life. In other words, we've got to ask ourselves if we want to be like the people we claim to admire. And if we do, we should imitate their manner of life. Of course, the writer of the Hebrews recommends the saints as a pattern for, our, for living our lives. But if we want to, our lives to be wholesome and godly, he says, we should imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The cross cuts away our resentments. Now, what you're going to note in life if you haven't already is that people will do us wrong. They will say bad things about it. They, they will laugh at us. They'll cause us pain. Sometimes their behavior will be so harmful to us that we have to seek justice either on our own, own behalf or the behalf of others. But resentment does no one any good. And as Christians, we are forbidden to strike back. The Lord forbids us to do that. And so justice for Christians is not about striking back. It's about stopping bad behavior that harms people and, if possible, getting restitution. But sometimes we can't control any of that. 
few times in my ministry, I've been called to serve people who have hurt me. Perhaps they once spread rumors about me that were not true or have been the cause of broken relationships that have caused me pain in life. And I don't claim not to think about such things when I go about my life or I meet people, but nonetheless, the teachings of Christ are plain about how we respond to those who have harmed us. We must forgive them and we must do it from our heart. We can't bring up the past unless we do so truly for the purposes of healing the relationship. Didn't Jesus teach this kind of stuff? And to model this principle, God forgives us for all of our sins. There's no sin so dark that God will not forgive if we just ask him. Right now where you're sitting, right there, if you can ask for God's forgiveness and you will receive it. If it helps you to confess your sins to others, we're glad to help you do that. There's lots of folks here that would love to hear confessions of sin. Just sign, sign up. <laughs> Some of them are gossips, but they, you'll have to deal with that later. But the important thing to know is that God will forgive us the moment we ask him without any human intermediary because Christ sits at the right hand of God constantly interceding for us. And when we ask him to forgive us, he will. Many of us have suffered things that we believe to be unjust or we may believe our loved ones now or in the past have suffered from injustice. And naturally we want to shine the light on that injustice and make things right and that is as it should be. There's no virtue in allowing injustice to fester in the dark. But at the same time, we seek the salvation and the redemption of those who have done unjust things. We don't allow our hearts to fill with hatred. And as we strive for justice, we pray for the perpetrators of injustice that they will come to repentance and know eternal life because God has no pleasure in the wicked, the Bible says. Peter once asked the Lord how often he should forgive his neighbor. Perhaps seven times, he thought. No, Jesus said, not seven times, 77 times every day. Well, that's a lot to ask. Now, it's comforting to know that what's impossible to human beings is possible to God. And we can be certain then because of what Jesus says that the Lord will forgive us each and every time we ask of him. We can nail our resentments to the cross. How do I know that? The one that knows the most about me forgives me the most. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. He's our model. We're walking behind. The cross crucifies our entitlements. Christ asks us to crucify our entitlements, those rights we think are owed to us because of our station in life, or our ethnicity, or our nationality, or some other characteristic we believe makes us unique or better than others. I was once at the border crossing going into Mexico, and I watched in amazement as the man in front of me began berating the border guard for not processing his papers quickly enough. So the Mexican guard replied politely and said he was doing his best. He was a little behind. And then at that, the man in front of me began berating that guard and telling him how, how much more effective things were on the other side of the border. And then he proceeded to tell this guard how backward and corrupt Mexico was. At that, the Mexican guard asked the American to please wait a minute while his papers were processed and then promptly tossed them onto a big stack of papers where I knew they would remain for some time to come. And then he turned glaring at me. And I said to him in Spanish, that helps, sir, I see that you work long hours and you put up with an awfully lot. I'm sorry for the way you were just treated. He looked at me a moment, took my passport, stamped my visa and told me have a good day. The man before me had needlessly offended somebody that was working hard at low pay because he believed his nationality granted him some kind of prefer preferential treatment. And this offense provoked a reaction and then a chain reaction of entitlement and offense brought things to an impasse. That's the way things work in the world. Now I've seen the same thing at airports. 
So a storm or something comes by and delays a flight, and the attendant is busy answering everybody's question, and somebody steps forward talking loud over everybody else and explain why he is more important than everybody else, how this turn of events is absolutely unacceptable, and somebody needs to do something immediately. Have you ever witnessed that? Yeah. Well, the gospel tells us to lay aside all that kind of stuff. Lay aside all attempts of lording it over others. How we address our legitimate needs with those who serve us, serve us is with kindness and respect. And we, uh, we do so in a way that doesn't unduly inconvenience or dishonor uh, others. Christ keeps me informed that I'm a human being working among other human beings and that I need to seek to know God and make God known through the way I live and through the way I speak to others. That's what Jesus did. He made himself of no reputation, the Bible said. He didn't seek to become known or to be in control. He submitted himself to his parents. He walked on the same roads with everybody else. Jesus prayed for rulers and slaves. He didn't come into the world acting like a big shot. Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. So let us, let us nail our entitlements to the cross. Here's one. Let us crucify our fear of death. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was the last person to be executed by the Nazis. And in his book, The Call to Discipleship, Bonhoeffer says, when Christ bids a man to become his disciple, he bids him to come and die. That's a strong statement, but Bonhoeffer knew that the fear of death is the king of all fears. As St. Paul said in one place, before we knew Christ, we were for our entire lives in bondage to the fear of death. When we stop fearing death, we lose with that the fear of disapproval, the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, the fear of poverty, and all other kinds of fears. When we lose the fear of death, we begin to live life as we believe it ought to be lived, and we find that path that we believe leads to life, and we follow it regardless of the cost. In the last couple of years, I've tried to share with you some of the anxieties and challenges I have felt with aging, including the work of giving up hundreds of my books, clothes I don't need but for some reason think I needed hanging in the closet, pictures and souvenirs from the many countries we have lived in. And I've got to tell you that giving up all this stuff has felt like I've been giving up pieces of my life. But the journey ahead requires all of my attention and I need to travel light. Other may, people may be able to use the stuff I give up, or it might go into those endless mountains of trash we keep erecting all over the country. But it hurts to give up what we believe to be our place in the world, our stuff, our control. But if we live long enough, we lose those things at any rate, gradually. And if we don't live long enough, we live them, leave them immediately. When we lose the fear of death, we release all these things voluntarily instead of begrudgingly, and we prepare ourselves to walk with God as the Lord leads into eternity in joy and peace. This path of self-renunciation and continual repentance is a part of our journey towards sanctification. God asks us to trust Him as we humble ourselves and act obediently to His teaching. Because God, in the end, is the one that's in control of our sanctification, our transformation in Christ. If we could have changed ourselves, we would have changed ourselves long ago. And so the Lord asks us to trust Him as we humble ourselves, as we act obediently to Him and to His teaching. And in due time, the Lord says He will lift us up, though we don't know exactly how He will do that. We are not in control of that. So I'm coming to the end here. And I don't want to imply that saints are always unknown or poor or can't be leaders because they are meekly submitted to Christ. Sometimes God calls people to surrender their peaceful and private lives and God puts them into the public sphere or sometimes he puts people to manage great resources for the good of humanity though they might have prepared a simpler life. Those things also we submit to the Lord. And the Bible tells us not to judge another person's servant. 
But last week, I want to conclude by acknowledging Dr. Billy Graham, great American evangelist. He died at age 99. Decade after decade, he preached to millions of people around the world. Billy Graham did his best to avoid sectarianism, partisan politics, racial segregation, and he resisted linking his faith with nationalism. He went anywhere he was asked in the world to preach the gospel by anybody that asked. He remained focused on the gospel, ministering to presidents of both political parties, doing his best to represent the gospel of Jesus in a way that transcended our differences. When we bury Billy Graham, we will probably be burying a way of thinking and ministering that to many now seems antiquated and no longer possible. I disagree with that though. I believe that Billy Graham stewarded his calling well. He didn't misuse his fame, and in those few times he felt he had overstepped his place, he apologized. He wasn't too big to apologize. And I don't know a better way to end this message today but to sing the hymn that was sung night after night, decade after decade in the great stadiums of the world. And a way to summarize this message and to recommit ourselves in this church to remain centered on the gospel of Jesus. That's for all people everywhere, for all classes, all races, all nationalities. Jesus says, come unto me all, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We don't need to carry anything with us that's too heavy that keeps us from centering on Jesus. Everything that takes our eyes off of Jesus that we think is for our good or the good of people around us, we have to give up and we've got to center on Jesus. Jesus is who saves us, sanctifies us, transforms us, take us to heaven. We've got to stay centered on Jesus. Everything else is a temptation. Amen. Amen. It's the way of the cross that is the way of life for the emperor and for the pauper, for the wealthy and the poor. Jesus has called us to travel light through this world. We're just here for a while. And as we reflect on him, he has promised to use us in a way that will bless us too. That's his promise to us, if we'll travel light. Would you like to stand with me and we'll just sing this? <clears throat> just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that Thou biddest me come to Thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I Just stand.